professionals and artists in our community and beyond uh, discussing topical issues for both the arts and the community at large. The Rochester Fringe Festival is a nonprofit organization and its mission includes providing a platform for those artists. Diversity and inclusion, so very important to the work of the Fringe Festival. It's the largest multidisciplinary performing arts festival in New York State. So congratulations for that. Uh, we all know that the performing arts provide a way for communities, small, large, and across the country, a way to have conversation, express ideas. Uh, Fringe didn't think it was appropriate to have these conversations in person. So that is how Fringe Talks was born. So please place questions in the Q&A. We want to make this as um, engaging as possible. We want to hear from you at home tonight. Uh, please place those questions in the Q&A and let us know what you want to talk about. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. Um, this is being simulcast on Zoom, Facebook, as well as YouTube. Closed captioning is available on Facebook. And also, if you are willing, consider a financial gift to The Fringe to allow it to make it through this year and into 2021. As you can imagine, it's been a very difficult year for arts organizations like The Fringe. You can donate right on the homepage by the website, uh, of the website by hitting donate. The link will be distributed in the chat as well. Thank you in advance. So let's get to our conversation tonight. We're talking about using storytelling to understand science. And with us, we have three wonderful panelists who I'm so excited to speak to this evening. Uh, we have David Calvito. He is an actor overseas right now uh, in London. He joins us all the way from there this morning, whereas I believe one o'clock in the morning or just about. David, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Norma. We also have uh, Marcy McGinnis, veteran television producer, uh, joining us as well. Thank you so much for being with us, Marcy. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. And Carolyn Hall. She is a marine scientist and dancer. And all three have um, had experience with the Alden, Alan Alda Center uh, of Communication. And we thank you so much for talking to us today because if you could briefly share what your um, involvement was uh, with that center. We'll start with you, David. Oh, okay. Um, well, I was hired about five years ago um, as an improvisation instructor. At the time, the Alda Center had sort of a two-unit system where there were improv people and then there were message design people to help scientists to, to communicate about their work better. And then later, those two disciplines were merged, so I got to do improvisation and then also do message design, storytelling, and uh, role play, and lots of uh, interesting stuff. Yeah. Carolyn, you've got an interesting uh, collaboration of marine science and dancing. Yes, so uh, actually the teaching communicating science through the Alan Alda method was really brought those two together for me because both arts and science. So I was officially a distilling your message or message design instructor, but was able to use a lot of my background in arts and performance and improvisation regularly through this method of teaching both distilling and improvisation. I love it. I still do it and I love it. That's wonderful. Marcy, given your years in television and working in broadcast uh, journalism, you brought uh, with you a pretty extensive toolkit, didn't you, to help scientists um, better communicate, right? Absolutely. Um, in addition to teaching them how to um, hone their message, uh, I was also um, happy to help them with their presentation skills and often with their media interview skills. So because sometimes they would be interviewed by reporters for print, broadcast, online publications. And so I was able to help them with that, too. Yeah. Think about how interesting the foresight was uh, that Alan Alda had to create um, you know, this kind of, uh, this kind of education for scientists, really, it's fascinating when you think about it, um, and how important those skills are today, my God, with what is out there, um, and with information coming from so many different sources. I know we talked about this uh, before we got on tonight, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we first met, um, but, but it's so important for scientists to craft that message, and then know how to best and most effectively uh, share that message, isn't it? Uh, it's difficult today, isn't it? There's so many different areas for that message to get out, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such an important time for truth and facts. And, you know, there's been no greater time than now to make sure that this stuff is, you know, is is told in an accurate way and a way that people can understand it. That's what we do. We help, we help the scientists be able to 
craft their message in a way that the general public can really understand it and grasp the importance of it. Right. Speaking and, uh, of that importance, right, also, David. Mm -hmm. I was going to say just also just to personally relate to it as well, not just as a sort of an academic uh, pursuit, but how it affects them personally, and also to find out how it affects the scientists personally as well, which helps to fuel the uh, interest and uh, the connection between the scientist and the, and the uh, audience. Yeah. Let's talk about how you worked with them in the beginning uh, when they first came to you, right? Um, are scientists like everyone else in the sense that they come to you with that the same phobias and the same fears and, and uh, the same hangups as everybody <laughs> else, right? I mean, um, some they of are. what they, right, and so some of what they came to you with is very universal, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, scientists might be a little bit more, they might be a little more shy than other groups. I might be going out of a limb uh, when I say okay. that. What do you, what do you guys think? Were they more shy than other groups of people? Carolyn, Marcy? Well, you know, scientists are trained to talk in very academic speak. That's right. their, that's, that's of value to them in their field, right? To be able to speak the, the technical language of whatever, whatever science they are in. And so to translate that to a public that may, may be deeply affected by what they're researching but can't understand that language, that's not necessarily in their training. So that's one of the, that's one of the big hurdles is how to get over that, that jargon or that technical language. Mm -hmm. And then to also find a way to, re like if it's a really microscopic or sort of abstract research, how to make that applicable to someone in their everyday neighborhood, how to apply it to their everyday lives. The performing arts and actors have a, and we talk about this, this, this word, a, a toolkit, have a, an extensive toolkit to actually, um, to, to, to teach scientists how to, to do that, how to more effectively communicate. David, what were some of the techniques that you used, and Carolyn and Marcy, what were some of the techniques you used with those scientists to get them to loosen up, to get them to feel connected to the message? Um, what were some of the things that you did with them to get them to, to be able to do their jobs better? Oh, there were a lot of silly games that we played. Um, <laughs> but not so silly, right? I mean, they had... Well, no, actually, actually, at first glance, they're silly. <laughs> I mean, we, we had a game where people would... Uh, write on one piece of paper an object that they have uh, at work and then on another piece of paper an object that they have uh, at home and we put those papers in different groups piles and uh, scientists would come up and randomly take one from each pile they would put that together and it's created a new object that they're mm. going to sell to a live audience ah. Like the suddenly the uh, scientist is the inventor of this new product. So in one pile you might have uh, a beaker from work and a bagel from home, and you're going to sell a beaker bagel. A beaker bagel. <laughs> right. And on the spot, come up with what does it do? What do you use it for? Uh, uh, why is it the best thing that was ever created? That was sort of a way to get them out of themselves. <laughs> and think fast, right? I mean, to think, think of fast, fast, yeah. Right, that extemporaneous, yeah. Uh, yeah. that that uh, the extemporaneous speech. I mean, Marcy, I know yeah. uh, as a as a former producer, but I'm a former reporter, so I mean, I I remember being in that scenario where I, I had to speak uh, eloquently about something I didn't know much about. Yep, you know, I'm going to yep. be honest, right? <laughs> yep, that's a, that's a skill. We know a little about a lot. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. But you know, one of the fun games that we that we taught um, the scientists was something called tri time traveler, and when somebody would pretend they were from the 17th century, and they had, and the other one was from now, and the scientists had to describe what this cell phone was and what what was you know without saying you know in 17th century language you know like, and so if they could describe what that cell phone was. For, like what it did as opposed to what makes it work. That was what was hard because a lot of them would go to that area of, well, it, it's got rays and it goes through the sky and they end up saying, well, it's magic. I don't know what it is, just magic. <laughs> yeah. But it was a, it's a very fun game because basically what they are, scientists, they're all time travelers, you know, like the, the people that are listening to them talk 
co are coming from not their area. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a great, that's a great skill, a great uh, exercise. I love that. Yeah. Carolyn, um, how did dance and your, the, the two blend for you? And did you use any of that with the folks that you worked with? Yeah, I, hmm. well, yes. When I decided to go back to, to graduate school for marine science, I'd been a professional dancer for in New York City for a number of years. And the biology side of my brain was craving education. And when I went back and I would go out on the sites with people doing field work before I was doing my own, there'd be people in the area who were like, what is this equipment? What are you doing? What, what, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. And the scientists were often, the people who I was helping out, they were often really busy and weren't used to communicating to sort of a general public with questions. But the performer side of me, the one who likes to connect with an audience, talking to the people who were asking those questions by like answering the audience, they wanted to know more. They became more invested in the research. They became more invested in the water body that we were working in and uh -huh. or the fish we were working with. And so that idea of seeing an audience that wants to hear from you and wants to understand what you're doing and responding to them in that same live moment, you make a connection that uh -huh. goes past something that you can read or the research that doesn't necessarily translate out. So that side definitely connected. That that's a I love that you said that that you are trying to connect with with people with everyday folks who for whom maybe this wasn't that important until they met you. So let's talk about how important this is today. Science is under attack um, for for lack of a better way to say it. Um, there's a, there are people who question science question scientists, question doctors, and what doctors know about coronavirus and COVID-19. And, um, and so how can scientists today do their jobs better using some of the techniques that you've just talked about, right? And, and how and why is that so important today? I feel like lives are on the line, right? Lives are at stake. Um, that, that's, a, that's a lot to weigh, a, 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 a large burden to bear, isn't it? Um, but scientists and, and those in the science community, they feel it, don't they? Yes, and it, it, it's why it's, I mean, the fact that they're under attack is makes it all the more important that they be able to speak clearly and accurately about their data and about their science um, and, and just stick to the facts, but say it in a way that, that regular people will understand and, and hopefully trust them. Trust, that's a very important word because in sharing that data, uh, people trust data, right? Or don't they? I mean, <laughs> data can be toyed with and can be you know, fudged a little bit, but um, a scientist who knows their facts, maybe I think, more likely I think the, to be trusted. The, it, it may depend on how you, if you trust the person. Okay. Uh, you can come armed with all the data that you have, uh, but if you don't trust the messenger, Okay. I think that that's going to lead people to doubt doubt the data. I think I think Anthony Fauci is a is a good example of someone who he's trustworthy. I trust him. He gives me data, and I believe it. What builds trust then when a scientist is speaking to an audience? What builds trust, and how how yeah. using what you all know can a scientist build trust? So on. many ways. So many ways. I, That's great. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I wanted to build off of something that Dave just said about the, the messenger is important. Yes. Um, because it depends on who you're talking to, what kind of a community you're talking to, a legislator, or whether you're talking to a, a group of people who are locally concerned about the condition of something in their community. And the messenger is important, and so is knowing so is knowing who your audience is and what their concerns are. So the trust comes from actually getting to know who you're talking to and understanding what they care about. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. The other part is, as someone who is speaking as an expert, you have to understand that everything you know isn't going to, you're not going to be able to give all of that to these people. You have to understand what it is of what you know that can relate to what they care about. 
So talking, talking to them about their concerns, about their values, about their locality, actually. So it requires a, a bit of research on the scientist's part, correct? Mm. Well, it, it can also just uh, require a little bit of conversation on the scientist's part. You know, like if you're talking one-on-one -on -one with someone and, you know, you're not going to convince a climate denier um, about climate change, you know, in a conversation at a cocktail party. Um, but perhaps you can find some common ground about what you both care about. You know, do we both care about the future for our children? Do we, you know, and you find some common ground. And right. then to Carolyn's point, you know, you figure out, you know, what do you care about? What do you deeply care about? Because underneath that climate change isn't real or, you know, ranting about something, there are some deep values that people care about. So if we can find those and then find that way into a conversation, it, it can sometimes be a little bit more fruitful. I love that once, because it disarms people once they realize that you have something in common with them, right? And, and there's a share, like you said, a shared value. Okay, mm -hmm. love that. Uh, we have a question for David and Carolyn. Um, has your work with science communication influenced you as a performing artist? If so, how? Hmm. Uh, am I going first? I can go. <laughs> I can go ahead, Carolyn. No yeah. pressure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I have found ways to merge my two interests. Yes. More since becoming a science communication instructor because I, well, part of it is I wanted to walk the walk, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, doing my science, I do talk about my science, but then also the sense of finding new ways to reach audiences in a way that were unexpected. And art actually communicates concepts and ideas, complicated concepts and ideas in a very accessible way. And so I've been playing with that with, um, with some colleagues in terms of creating sort of experiential walks where people have to use their senses and use their imagination to understand how climate change can affect people's local shorelines. And it's been really fun. Wow. So instead of walk the walk, it's dance the dance, maybe? <laughs> had to do it, Carolyn. Sorry, had to go there, okay? I appreciate had to go it. There. <laughs> How about you, David? Norma, I would say, yeah, just thinking about it, that the working with the scientists was so important to me. I always felt mm -hmm. like, it always felt like a, a really big opening night with all the critics there. Uh. It just raised the stakes of what I was doing in front of a group of people to a point that I, I didn't even remember from when I was an actor because it doesn't happen all that often uh, or, or it doesn't have the same effect on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm equating, you know, being in front of the uh, communicating, make a connection with the audience of the scientists with the theatrical audience. Um, I think it, it, was like, it was like doing really heavy lifting and then I came out of it and went into a regular theater and felt, oh, this is light. These these weights are light. Yeah. And again, it wasn't it wasn't because the scientists were hot, difficult people or anything. It was that I just felt I just felt the uh, importance of it. I was I felt just so honored and uh, to be able to work with uh, people like them. Um, and I always wanted to give my best. Yeah, I love that. That was so, I like that you said that, that your work with them was so important to you, that, that, that getting them to, um, that you could affect change yes, with correct. them. That's, that's yeah. a very, that's a, that's a feeling of honor, right? Um, yes. This is a really great question that we just got. Um, and this is, this is so perfect, especially considering what scientists are dealing with today. There is currently a very high rate of burnout amongst uh, public health experts. Was burnout something that you addressed as science communicators? And if so, what would you recommend to public health experts to avoid this? Um, and I'm thinking, of course, here in, in, in Rochester, where we're um, recording this tonight, or where we're uh, live tonight. But I mean, this is universal, right? I mean, they're, they're working hard, you know, 24-7, you know, answering questions, dispelling myth, dispelling, you know, answering rumors and, and separating fact from fiction. Um, was this ever anything that, that came up with the people that you worked with, the burnout factor and just being exhausted? 
I think that they got exhausted um, when they were trying to convince someone of something. And yeah. that's when the frustration would come in. Okay. And then they would want to just back off and say, you know what, it's, it's useless. I can't convince somebody. So, you know, it, it was difficult to, to see that, to see the frustration in their, in their eyes and, and hear them talk about it. And so one of the most important things we tried to help them with was taking care of themselves mm -hmm. and basically understanding, look, your message is really, really important. And, and how you can tell your message is important. And it's also important to take care of yourself. So, you know, when you're off that shift or when you're not, you know, you know, under the lights, um, you know, if, if you need time to decompress and be by yourself, then take it. If you need time to talk to someone in your family about it, talk to them about it. But take care of yourself first so that, so that you know, the next day you can live to almost, you know, fight another day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that the, the, what you feel inside is, is what keeps you going, you know, and, the, and it's the same for scientists as it is just for about anybody else. True. You know, if you feel deeply about what you do, then you'll be able to tell people what you do in, in a interesting way. And, and, you know, it'll come through as, as authenticity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think scientists, I don't think they had too much of an issue with burnout because they, they, I think they, I always got the sense from every scientist I met that they were doing the best job in the whole wide world. They just loved what they did and they were just so into it and they could do it by themselves alone in a room uh, and, uh, or with their colleagues and, and do it forever and never get any recognition or just, just doing their work. The thing that was hard for them was, as Marcy said, oh, gee, I, I, if I have to talk about it, you know, how do right. I, how do I get past all of the things like the jargon and the, uh, the institutional language and, um, but yeah, they're they they seem to be the the some of the happiest people I've ever met. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think, right, the exhaustion of having to talk about it, but I also think that there is sometimes some frustration and some burnout about not being understood. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what I, what I found in the workshops actually with either us as the instructors or with their peers in working how to make their, how they talk about their work more comprehensible to people not in their specific field, they got reignited talking about it because mm. other people got True. excited about it too. Right. So there's something also about finding a, compassionate listener who's who's wanting to be excited about what you do as well it's like they're speaking different languages right i mean think about it so yes. there is that jargon right and then there's that the language of the listener and it takes a lot of practice to be able to marry the two in and create almost a whole new language for the for the scientist yeah um, that's tough that's tough for anybody yeah. But especially and they get afraid. Yeah. yeah. They get afraid that they're dumbing it down. You know, one of the things we heard all the time was, you know, I'm not going to dumb down my science so that, you know, Joe Citizen can understand it. And we would try and, you know, help them understand that we weren't asking them to dumb it down in any way whatsoever. We wanted to just help them make it clearer so yeah. that so that Joe public would understand what the importance of it. That's a great point. I like that. So don't be, a, it wasn't to be, you don't want them to be um, uh, insulted. It's not, it, you're, it, we're not insulting their intelligence, right? We're just saying, listen, let's, let's make your message understood by, mm -hmm. by many yeah. instead of a few. Some medical schools are, this is another question. Some medical schools are now realizing that they need to diversify their candidate pool in many ways. One of those ways is that some med schools are now emphasizing non-science undergrad majors as well as mature students. Did you find that certain people with only a science or math background had more difficulty with communication? We kind of talked about this at the very beginning uh, about scientists and the challenges that they face as communicators. Did you find uh, that they perhaps may have had more difficulty with communicating against uh, those folks who are science and math versus uh, perhaps uh, 
another major art or some other um, kind of major? You know, I went to Chicago once and worked with uh, status, statisticians. And I thought, boy, this is really going to be boring. Uh, this is going to be a really dull group. And they were one of the best groups ever. And so I don't think, I, 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 I wouldn't make a, a I, don't, I didn't see anything that looked like a generalization in that sense in terms of what their field was. Okay. Yeah. In fact, they were prepared for it. I remember at, at, when we were having questions at the or comments at the end, like "How was your experience?" and you know the big the the wrap up. One of the guys said to me, "You thought we were going to be really boring, didn't you?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Mike, I did." <laughs> I got They were tell fantastic. You, I went to a holiday party with a bunch of. I uh, was invited to a holiday party. Um, a local doctor invited me. And I'd known them only in their capacity as, as physicians. To, to, to see them uh, in a setting that was not um, work-related, they were a ton of fun. And I just thought, wow, you, you guys are a lot of fun. You ladies and, and gents are a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, right. You can't judge a book by its cover, right? Yeah. 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 I, on a related point, I also have worked with some religion scholars and talk about big... Uh, concepts and wow, uh, a range of histories, a range of thinking, very technical actually, and um, I, just as challenging as scientists. So wow, it, it's interesting. I, I think that it depends on on how much experience maybe or how much you've thought about communicating mm -hmm. what you do outside of your field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, we concentrate on scientists, but. If you think about it, there's so many industries where people have their own language and you know, you could um, speak to each other in that language and, and basically cut everyone else out of it. Um, but you know, our point is no, include people. You know, let's, let's get rid of that jargon. Let's tell people about our different jobs, our different industries that we're in. And, and it'll be interesting because the more people know about what other people are doing, the more fun it's gonna be and the more interesting it will be. How about men versus women? Was there a difference in the the two, in the way that they, um, perhaps in the way that they uh, accepted your your challenges to them, right, as instructors, or in the way that they performed, or in their outcomes? Um, well, yeah. Anybody? No. I don't think so. Not really. Oh, I think yeah. I don't think so. I mean, That's good. There's such a range. I mean, it goes with the question of di diversity. The more diverse group of people you have, the more different kinds of reactions. And I didn't really, I didn't really see a male-female split. No. Okay. No. Just wondering. I, I that was a great. That was one of the questions we got too. Um, there may be yeah. confidence issues. Confidence issues. Right. In the sense of, I mean, this comes up a lot in the sense of um, women in a field feeling less empowered to lead. Um, but in terms of the ability to translate their research or their expertise, not specifically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Confidence is, is huge, right? And that's key. You've got to feel like you can do the work and you can do, uh, and, and do what you, what, um, what you're being asked to do. Um, so that's good. That's, that's a difficult piece to get over. That's huge actually. Right. right. Um, yeah. What, what would you say, what are the quick lessons that you would give someone today um, for us all really to more effectively communicate difficult topics? Look, we're having difficult conversations with folks at the grocery store, all right, in the parking lot, uh, at the, you know, when you're dropping your kids off with your neighbor, you know, when you're both taking mm -hmm. out the trash. I mean, we're having, with our family members, we're having difficult conversations. What are, um, and, and not just science, not just about science, but, you know, um, politics or you name it, social, uh, you know, social uh, movements that are going on right now, Black Lives Matter. I mean, uh, what are some quick lessons you can give us for all, uh, to us all for doing that more effectively? Well, Marcy, you talked about the common ground and- Which I love. Uh, uh, that's really it. It's, it's, yeah. it's reacting to someone else's rant. Why don't you talk about that, Marcy? Yeah, we have a Again. we have an uh, improv game um, that we play when we're training people, and it's called the rant. And so you one person stands and just listens to another person rant about anything they want to rant about. Like oh. you know, my mother climbs up on the 
on the kitchen table to close to, to change a light bulb and it makes me crazy and like screaming and yelling and screaming and yelling for like 90 seconds about how crazy it makes her that her mother climbs up on a table to change a light bulb. So then the 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 game is what does what does she really care about? Uh. Like, and so then you find out, well, she cares deeply about her mother. She cares deeply about her mother's safety. She cares very much about, um, you know, that, that there are people near her mother to take care of her. So all of these things that you've, and, you, and when you describe the rant, you're not allowed to say the rant. You're not allowed to say she, she was worried when her mother stands on a table. You have to say, she's deeply concerned about her mom. She's deeply, you know, so you find- Yeah, the prompt, value. the prompt to- Go ahead, David. I'm sorry, I just want to say the prompt is, what did you learn about that person? What did you and, learn? And, and as Marcy said, you don't discuss the rant at all, any of the details of what she talked about. So, as she, yeah. So, it's it's she's so, a person who cares about her mother's safety. Okay. That's tough, though, because don't we listen to respond? We're, we're bad <laughs> in general, right? I mean, are, I, I know. I... I when I listen to some people discuss difficult topics, sometimes uh, people listen to respond and not to what the people are saying. That's yes, you, that's the exercise, looking past the rant, looking past the emotion uh, uh, or the anger, I should say. Okay. And, uh, and to what it is that they deeply care about. Like okay. If someone, if someone is an anti-vaxxer, uh, what's the common ground? What's behind the rant? Behind the rant is... Uh, you learn what did I learn about this person. This person cares about the health of her, uh, of his or her children. Uh, there's the common ground. That's looking past the the anger uh, that might be there in terms of you know someone thinking that uh, the government is trying to right control their children or. What's the strength in that in finding that common ground? I mean, that's a very. Um conversations can really take off from there, can't they? Mm. And, and a conversation is not just waiting for your turn to talk, you know, to the point that you made earlier, you know, where, you know, oh, I just want to, I want to, I want to say what I want to say. I'm listening so that I can talk, you know, how about listen to listen and learn something. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we try to teach is we try to teach active listening so that people aren't just standing there waiting for their turn to talk. Maybe they're listening to say, wow, what do I really hear underneath this, you know, what appears to be a crazy statement? Like, I won't vaccinate my child. So we find out things. Right, and by listening in that way, then you actually can create a true connection, like a person-to-person -person connection, rather than standing on some sort of ideal you can actually hear the person and what they're saying, what they care about, and you can then relate as a human being back to them. I, I draw, we all draw upon our personal experiences whenever we encounter difficulty. Um, I remember doing that with folks who would call the newsroom upset about a story that we did. Um, and I would, boy, Marcy, you, you just said it, you know, someone's ranting at you and you have to try and say, it really sounds like you're very upset. Um, I remember one gentleman said, you're, you're patronizing me. And I said, no, 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 sir. I'm really trying to understand you. Right. And it was trying to, to literally trying to dis, dis, diffuse him. Right. So that we could actually have a conversation about what he was upset about. So, um, it's, I love how you put that, you know, when, when you're talking to someone who's just yelling and you're like, okay, I'm just going to listen to what you're saying and not react and not be so reactive, but that's difficult for us. Right. Because we're so primed to, to react. Yeah, so. and listen listen to what they care about. Like find yeah. out what they care about because that can help you. Okay. All right, I like that. Are you listening at home? I hope you're all listening and thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna take some of these some of these things and, and use them in my day-to-day -day life. Um, we talked about Alan Alda at the beginning, of course, the reason we're all here, um, you know, as um, for his many years on television, and of course, and, and as a science. Um, host of a, of a show about science. I mean, did he instruct any of you personally at all? Or did you get to, to yeah, you, he did? What was that like? Well, it was wonderful. Um, you know, he's, he's an actor and he credits improv for his success as an actor. So to watch him train people and for him to train us was phenomenal. That's you know? amazing. And then, 
Yeah, I mean, his love for science combined with his love for acting, it's like Carolyn's love for science and her yes. love for dancing. It's just, it, it's just like this magical combination that made you want to just be in his presence and, and learn more and more and more. Marcy was the lucky one. Uh, Carolyn and I did not get to work with Alan Alda. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Marcy, <laughs> you must have felt like uh, sitting in the presence of just, you know, greatness, I guess, when he was talking to you and learning from him. I mean, totally. Totally. Yeah. You no, know, I, I, I was um, lucky enough to be one of the founding members of the of the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. So the day he came to Stony Brook to ask for help in trying to train scientists, uh, you know, the idea that I was sitting in a room with him was just like, oh, my God, I've had a crush on this guy since I was like in the seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You're like, I had a crush on this guy. And here I am learning from him. Yeah. Um, you, you both, all three of you look back on your experience with, um, with the center with so much fondness, I can tell, and it's continued to inform your, your lives today as, as, uh, performers, but also as professionals in Marcy's case, working with folks in their communication skills. Um, I love that. Uh, well, here's a, here's another great question I wanted to ask you about. Um, are there creative ideas for getting people excited about science? Uh, how would you tell someone to, or how would you instruct someone to get others excited? I, Carolyn, you said, look, when, when, when a scientist is able to connect with their audience and get them excited about what they're excited about, there's this great feeling of, aha, right, I've got them. What are some creative ways to do that, to get those scientists, to get others excited, just as excited as they are, maybe? Well, I mentioned the combination of art and science, and I actually... I, I advocate this. I really think that there are, there are collaborations with artists and scientists to bring the science to a more accessible, interactive, fun way of understanding it. Um, I work with a group called Works on Water, which is all about artists who work on water issues. Mm -hmm. So it could, be, it could be accessibility to water, it could be uh, migration, it could be climate change, it could just be the water itself and the, and the amazement that you have at this water body and what's in it. Mm -hmm. But people who are coming in to watch their films or to look at how they're growing algae into lights or things like that, like they're using science to make art and then people want to know more about the science. And all of these people making these work, they're talking to scientists about what they're making art about. So they're actually having a collaborative experience and bringing that to a general public that the public can then go back in and learn more about the science. It's this really generative, creative way of exposing science to, to the public. And just right. to build on that, you know, it's, it's also about, it's about storytelling. You know, you're, you know, you're a scientist that deals with, you know, fish. How many stories must you have? I mean, you must have a million different stories and they're all interesting and fun and visual. You know, if you don't have the picture of the fish that, that you study, you know, you can, you can imagine it in your head when the, when the person starts to describe it, you know, whether it's large or tiny or, you know, big gills or whatever. So storytelling in this world, you know, in the science world is just beautiful because people get very excited when they tell their story about their science. So if you're telling a story about it, Look, we're storytellers, we're journalists, you know, and and so we know that that excites people and it's it's not any different for scientists. We used to say people connect to people. Yeah. Not necessarily to data. Uh, so maybe people connect to fish, right? I mean, we all have, you know, a formative experience. Maybe we went fishing as kids or... Uh, you know, you, you had to cook fish as a kid with your mom and dad, and you remember, right, catching it and bringing it home and that kind of thing. So there's a great, so stories are very powerful. Indeed, I agree. Yeah. And that game I mentioned uh, earlier, Norma, the Beaker Bagel game, yeah. that was designed to uh, tap into the uh, scientist enthusiasm. Yes. Uh, they weren't talking about their work, though. It was completely separated from their work. It was, uh, and they, the job was to, sell it like you would an infomercial hmm. big gestures over the top excitement like we pushed them uh beyond you know we're, it's not natural like this this product is stupid it's ridiculous yeah. doesn't make any sense so just don't worry about that but push your energy push your uh your vocal range yeah. uh 
and and also create a story about it. Like they had, they, as they were saying, that uh, you've got to find out what's this thing for. You've got to create a narrative, a very quick narrative. I, I want I want you to talk about this, David. Um, that matters, doesn't it? Uh, a person's enthusiasm, level of enthusiasm, when they're speaking about something, that's infectious. Um, it's infectious sometimes yeah. when we're very familiar with a topic. Um, <clears throat> maybe we know it so well that we don't emphasize things as well as we should, right? Because we know the topic so well. Uh, but exactly. if you're trying to get, right? So if you're trying to get others excited, we need to use gestures and facial expressions and vocal intonation. Those are all really, really key to get others Absolutely. excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the way that we, we, we approached it, we, we made clear that like, we're not giving you tips on public speaking. Uh, you know, uh, raise your voice to this octave. Um, not that that's in, in any real public speaking class, but <laughs> but what we did was we, our job was to convince them, you do this all the time yourself. We're not making you into some, like one of the things we used to say a lot is that we're not, we're not here to make you actors. Uh, these, we're gonna tap into enthusiasms and, and passions and uh, vocal ranges and a, a vocal range that happens when you are apt really excited about something right right it's not like we're going to teach you a technique right. to do that we're going to get you get you to get in touch with your passion about it so this stuff just happens naturally because right. we all are this when we're with our friends and our families we we we're animated we're funny um we know how to talk differently to a six-year-old or a 60-year-old uh who's in the family you just know right. it it's natural Right. But when you get up in front of people and you're supposed to be the expert, like we forget these things. You know, uh, as we await a vaccine for for COVID-19, there's going to be renewed discussion about science and the efficacy of a vaccine and who's going to get it and all this communication surrounding a vaccine. Right. We're all sitting waiting with bated breath. Right. And there's all these trials going on right now. Um, what are some of the best practices for for you know uh, folks at at a high level, the CDC, you know the FDA, and others when they're um, trying to educate the public about a vaccine? Because that's that for some is a very tough sell, right? Yeah. Well, it's a tough sell because there's a trust issue going on, and there's a trust issue mm -hmm. going on because there's a mixed message going on. Okay. So, you know, I think that if, you know, if the science community, you know, was able to speak with one voice the way it, you know, without any kind of, you know, political interference, then, you know, the trust issue might be a little bit stronger. But I think right now we're living in a very divisive time where there's mixed messages and the public is, is it doesn't know who to believe. They, they're, they're frustrated and, and upset. And you can imagine it. I mean, you know, in the beginning, it was like, oh, the second of vaccine's ready, I'm going to take it. And now it's down to something like, you know, 49% of the people are saying that they will because they're afraid. And they're saying, you know, if Fauci takes it, I'll take it. But I'm not taking it unless Dr. Fauci takes it. And that's a trust thing going on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all about building, building that trust. Social media has also played a really important role in the dissemination of information during this pandemic. Uh, I recall getting text messages from friends with uh, of a meme or something or some infographic that in you know uh, talked about uh, if you want to kill coronavirus, you know take a take a, a blow dryer and put it down your throat and the heat will kill the vaccine. But I'm saying this was being sent to me by people who I would say are pretty smart, right? But and of course that was proven to not be real. It's not fact again. But the, the social media just sort of shot it out there. And now you know you're get, I'm getting messages from my relatives saying, "Did you know this?" And I'm like, "Where did you find this?" Right. So so it is so important in as we head into these days where uh, closer to the day a vaccine is found that 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 information comes from one source. Easier said than done, right, Marcy? I mean, that's you know we can all wish for that, but it may not be happening right now. Yeah. Well, let's just hope it's coming from, you know, a trusted source of somebody who's an expert in that field. Right. When we're watching the news, who do you trust? Again, trust is so key. We all choose and we all have our own source that we trust um, for news or for any information, right? Some people trust it if they see it on Twitter. 
which is scary. <laughs> Don't always trust what you read on Twitter. Um, but but the point is we all have our go-to source, right? Um, and we have to trust that source. How do you, um, oh, I love this. This is a great question. You'll love this. Um, Alan Alda really was ahead of his time, wasn't he, when it came to science communication. Uh, but Bill Nye the Science Guy, the Magic School Bus, science YouTubers, um, have they changed the way, do you think the next generation of scientists will tell their stories? Are young scientists today or scientists to be, are they at an advantage perhaps over scientists from long ago or before? Um, and that they understand social media, they understand me, you know, media and how to get their message out. Um, and they've grown up with these scientists, right? Who are personalities, they have personality. Um, what do you think, Carolyn? Oh, you see me nodding along. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I do. I mean, I think that, okay, so within academia, there is there is more of an effort to include communication as part of an education in science. But also the the young people who are enthusiastic about, about STEM, about science, about yes. technology, about math, they are using their own platforms to communicate it and to create communities. And so it's actually much more inclusive and it's, it's not as um, restricted to those who are within sort of the ivory tower. Yeah. It's actually reaching more communities. And I really, I really love that it is great to have a personality as a scientist. Mm, uh -huh. And actually there are lots of credible young people putting out science on social media and it's really exciting. My daughter the other day saw a TV commercial about needing more women in STEM, right? And my daughter, she's four, goes, Mommy, do you know we need more female scientists? She was, very, <laughs> she was so impassioned. Mommy, we need more female scientists. I said, well, I said, well, maybe you should become a scientist. And then, of course, she kind of scrunched up her nose at me. I don't know. She may not be the scientist in our family, but she might be. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of that push toward getting young people interested in STEM. And STEM education, we hear so much about, you know, being offered at schools and everything. So hopefully that will make a difference. Um, you know, we, uh, in Rochester, we are, I know I'm pumped. I had a telescope when I was 12, so I'm loving this next story. Um, we're about to experience a total solar experience in 2024, right? This is a big deal here. And there are already people planning this in our community, right? How to get everyone into what do they call the path of totality and you know and, and inviting people the tourism travel and tourism people are just they're huge about this um of course naturally uh what would you say is like best practices for communicating this to the public right all the information all the science behind what's about to happen in 2024 I'm just remembering the solar eclipse that happened. What was that? Two? Yeah, years? it was two years ago, I think. Yes. Yes. Two years ago. I think. And yeah. I felt like everyone I knew. Everyone. Could not wait to go out with some sort of like, what were they called? The pinhole cameras? The pinhole. Or yep. Mm -hmm. Or the special glasses to special glasses. prevent eye damage. Yeah. And I, what I think what was this happens a lot with with sort of space and other kinds of sciences that have to do it's the wonder yes right? it's this fantastic movement of the spheres that we don't necessarily understand but affect us because we are on one of those planets that are coming that are moving around in these orbits and it's the wonder and awe that we can see something like that happen your sun the sun can be blocked out by another planet Mm -hmm. And so I think it starts there. It starts there with like with the unique, spectacular notion that mm -hmm. that these bigger motions are happening, and we're just on one of these planets. I was saying how small we are compared to what's lit. I mean, the big things, literally big things happening all around us. I, I misspoke, by the way. I called it a total solar total solar experience, and it is an experience. Okay, if you're in the path of totality. <laughs> Let's be real. I didn't necessarily totally misspeak. It's totally you know what? Eclipse. It's such a great opportunity because it's going to be one of those <laughs> total eclipse of the heart. Okay. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Sorry. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I told a joke. I was going to say it's, it's a great opportunity because it's one of those times, just like Carolyn said with the, with the eclipse, it's a time that literally everyone's talking about the same thing and it's not depressing. It's fun. It's interesting. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity for the experts who know about this stuff to be able to reach a huge audience because everyone cares and everyone's interested and it's fun and it's not depressing and it's not it's not bad for you and all that you know it's so it's a great great opportunity for the for the scientists to be able to explain this and maybe you know get some of those little kids like your like your daughter yeah. you know interested in in yeah. you know the planets Okay, so while we're talking about laughing, and we're laughing, we are laughing, ha, ha, ha. I mean, it's, it, scientists, I feel like they need a break. They've had a, a year from hell in 2020, and you know we're looking forward to 2024, the total solar eclipse of the heart. Like, I'm going to call it that, okay? Uh, the total solar eclipse of the heart. So we're all looking forward to that. But using humor, David, humor is extremely potent, isn't it? Um, yes, it when is. it comes to communication, how can we use humor to punctuate what we're saying and to get people and to make a message more memorable, perhaps? Well, again, I think it comes just down to it comes down to connecting with yourself, who you are, the real person that you are. When you're you're a fu you're a funny person when you talk to your friends, you're a funny person when you talk to your family, and. It's, I mean, it's not about, you know, getting us a, a speech writer, you know, uh, to write jokes for your talk, you know, um, finding, I mean, as anyone, I mean, anyone, you know, the people who find humor in everyday life are engaging, wonderful people that everybody wants to know, right? Um, so it's not a matter of, it's a matter of connecting with that part of yourself. Um, no one, no one can teach you to be funny. Being funny is an expression of who you are, and that, and that was about what our work was with the scientists. Just right. we want you to get connected with. You're going to connect with an audience, but you're also your your way to get there is to express and show them who you are. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Everybody's hard to teach funny. humor, though. Really hard to teach. You can't teach. You humor. can't. No, you can't. You can just. You can create the conditions and right. a mindset uh, where people will allow themselves to be as funny as they are usually. Or, I mean, I guess you. What you can do is just to get someone to relax enough to to find the parallels, the the things that are funny in the ordinary or in the extra extraordinary like right. like the work that they do right and, and it, it all gets back to the storytelling when somebody somebody's yeah. usually you know funny or you know when they're telling a story so oh listen to what happened in the lab today you're not even going to believe it it was like crazy and then they describe something that maybe if they were just telling it to an audience they would say and in the lab we had a mis malfunction when the da, 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 da. but if they're telling it in a funny way like ay, 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 you know again it's just <laughs> storytelling is the way to connect with people and right. and because they do connect and if you're telling a story that's self-deprecating you're telling a story that's you know humorous or something went wrong and people don't think it's gonna go wrong in a in a lab you know so you know it's it all gets down to human beings telling each other stories about important work that they do and whether humor is part of it or sarcasm is part of it or whatever you know it's it's about communicating sarcasm is powerful too Mm. right yeah yeah you got to know your audience yeah. true <laughs> or it could go over like a lead balloon right oh, yeah. big time bad <laughs> <laughs> um for online communication we're doing a lot of this aren't we a lot of this zoom right we're in the we're in a box we're the brady bunch i'm looking down at you you're looking up at me that kind of thing <laughs> what are some tips for better um effective communication online like this well, I don't it. know. <laughs> it starts with this, like you don't do this, and you don't do this, and you don't do this. Okay, right, right, okay. That's, like, that's just like 101, that's yeah. for yourself and have a light on you. Yeah. Get one of those lights. Oh, look at you, David. Oh, of course he's the actor with his, he needs good lighting, of course. 
But I look orange. So no, I don't doing think so. Wrong. It's warm. It's a warm light, David. Oh, okay. Warm light. It's warm. Um, right. I also think it's not forgetting that you're also a full body, right? Yeah. Like, yes, you're on a screen, but you're not just a face frozen on a screen. Like, in the way you have to breathe, in the way you settle in your chair, like, you are connected to a full body and not being frozen actually makes you more relatable and more human. Ah. And here's something. Don't ever do this. <laughs> Uh, uh, Villa? I had to go do something over there. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so you're saying I need to be present. Be present. Don't. Yeah. That Hold was an illustration. Second. I just performed an illustration to make a point. Norm. Illu oh, oh, there we go, folks. This, these are the communications experts. That's this is why they teach, folks. All right. He used illustrative illustration to make a point. I have a roast in the oven. I'll be back in five. But continue what you're saying. Very important. Loving it, right? But again, so be present yes. for your audience. And, and learn the technology ahead of time so that you're not sitting there going, like, where's the where's the button? I, I, don't, see I don't see it. Where is it? What's a chat box? You know, like, learn it. Yeah. Learn it. I love that. I love that. Um, you, you've all have had such great, and I heard you talking earlier about what you're all doing right now. What what are you working on right now? Can you share with us what you're all doing now, um, David? I know in the art in the arts world and in Carolyn as performers. I mean, it's it's been very difficult for you. I can imagine. Um, what are you no, working yeah. on right now? I I had an audition uh, via a live Zoom audition, okay. which is my first one since the lockdown, uh, and I booked it on the spot. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm going to be singing for the first time in my career. Show us. Yes. Sing a few bars, David. Uh, it's an old, it's an Irish lament. Oh. I'm not going to sing it. No. <laughs> it's a little sad. Uh, but uh, I've had a lot more voice auditions. That's great. That's good. How about you, Carolyn? Well, the dancing has been interesting. There's some online, some collaborative sort of video, but um, I'm looking forward to a weekly practice of meeting up with friends in a park and doing socially distant improvisation. I can hardly wait to be moving with other human beings. <laughs> oh, improv in, in uh, oh, wow, that's exciting. That's exciting, yeah. yeah sort of responding to responding to the site, responding to the actions of the other dancers. Um, yeah, but also still working on sort of virtual explorations of climate change on shorelines. Been doing a lot of that mm. over this time, which has been really fascinating and really uh, actually more engaging than you would think. Lots of Instagram action. I was going to say, do you think that because we are all home or have been home for all these months, we've been out taking walks mm. and seeing for the for the first time in many years, perhaps, or uh, nature up close? We take our children out, and so we're maybe more concerned about. The, the the environment around us i think people are are definitely more invested in what's in their neighborhood and that's that's something mm. that we can tap into that's a good that's point great. yeah because we're all this is what we see on a daily i've been walking daily and i notice you know in our neighborhood things i never noticed before so how about you marcy what what keeps you busy these days well um Carolyn and I just did a wonderful um, three-day workshop with the American Fisheries Society, where um, I taught them how to do how to connect to the media, ah. and and then we conducted media uh, workshops, how to do media interviews for for the people in the American Fisheries Society. So that was fun, and got a lot of clients who are still job hunting and and uh, have issues with their careers, and so I'm doing a lot of that help, and and in fact, more of it on Zoom now than, than even when we were in person, so it's good. Well, that's right, I mean, David, you said you auditioned uh, via, what was it, Skype or, or Zoom? Zoom, yeah. Yeah, this isn't going away anytime soon, I feel. No. But we need to know how to do this, this well, um, so yes. that people can see us and not our limitations. But not that I haven't been on camera at home because all of my other auditions have been uh, filming myself Ooh. and then mailing it in or emailing wow. it to the to the casting director. Okay. So yeah. scientists may even need to know how to be production, do their own production, right? Good lighting and all that, just saying. Mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. Um, is, what is, yeah. I was just going to say, but that's what Marcy and I were talking about partly in those interviews. It's how to be camera savvy. Right. What's one Aren't you final... two going to plug your business? <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> If anybody wants communication training, we're available. That's my script, David. I'm kidding. No. Marcy, Marcy talks fast. She knows. We've only got less than we've got like what? Oh, goodness. Maybe nothing. No time left. Uh, maybe we're all we're all timed out. But no, actually, no. Quick, quick second tip. Um, more effective communication. One final takeaway. David, you first. Another one? Another one. Just one final tip. Uh, uh, be yourself. Be yourself, Carolyn. Find find what the person you're talking to cares about. I like that. Find what the person you're talking to cares about. Okay, Marcy. And tell them a story. Tell them a story. I love it. All right. And while we're at it, go ahead and plug the business. Go ahead, Carolyn. Go ahead, Marcy. Hey. Well, we're just, go we're ahead. really excited to do more of these communication workshops. So um, we're, we're doing them on Zoom. All right. Go. I thought they had a, a, a different kind of business. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Um, any of you, uh, all of you, I should say, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really great conversation. Um, David, thank you, I know Norma. it's super early where you are. Thank you for staying up late uh, or early, whichever way you, you want to look at it, um, to join right. us. Carol and Marcy, wonderful to have your advice um, and join us in your experience. Great, thank great you. talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Norma. Thanks to everyone who, who came in tonight and shared their questions with us and their thoughts. We really appreciate it. And be sure to stay tuned to the next Fringe Talk live on Zoom or YouTube, whichever you prefer, or Facebook. Have a great night, everybody.